life is more is more about recognizing opportunity, creating opportunity, or seizing opportunity. Opportunity is, uh, man, that's a good one. Does anyone listen to Common in here? There's a really dope Common line where he says, opportunity knocks, but he didn't call before he came. Opportunity does knock, and opportunity does sort of like flow in the air, but it doesn't call you to say, I'm gonna be there at five o'clock on Tuesday, so you better answer the door. Like, you have to always be ready for opportunity, you know? And I, have, I know so many people that are so talented, so amazingly gifted, but they're not getting anywhere in their career because they're not open to like sort of grabbing the opportunity. I almost feel like opportunity is like butterflies, but if you don't actually reach out with a net and get it, they're just gonna fly right over you and you get to see how other people catch those butterflies, you know? What's your secret weapon in your creative process? Like what gets you there? Um, my secret weapon is what I'm doing right now, is traveling. Traveling and meeting people and just like connecting with everyday homies on the street. When I go to a city, like I haven't gone to your Space Needle or your like Pike Place Fishery. Like I don't go to like the tourist places when I land in the city. I wanna like sit in a cafe and take a taxi and like talk to the taxi driver. This industry that we're in, it's funny, right? Like it's called street culture. People call it streetwear, street culture. And then if you think about like the actual etymology of that word, it's not about how people wear their pants or what color they wear, or what kind of brands they wear. It's called street culture because we actually exist like on these streets. We walk these streets, we take mass transit, you know, we like, we hustle and grind much like a pigeon, which is why it's my, you know, it's the logo. If you wanna like excel in this particular industry, you cannot lose sight no matter how big you get of the people who live and breathe on these streets, whoever they are, you know, it's not about sneaker lineups or like, you know, resellers or any of the hype that's happening. Streetwear is about people who live on the streets. And I'm not talking about homeless people, but I'm talking about like people who live and operate on these streets, you know? Recently, Raph Simmons criticized brands like Off-White and v Vitamins for not bringing anything original to fashion. He said, quote, I'm inspired by people who bring something that I think has not been seen that is original. It's not always about being new new, because who is new new, end quote. What are your thoughts on those critiques? What are your thoughts on the drive to be new new? I think that there's nothing new under the sun. So there's two schools of thought, right? One is that you believe that there's nothing new under the sun. And then there's the other one where it's like, you can actually create something new new. And I'm of the, of the mindset that everything has been done already and it's just about how you can add your like flavor to it it's like with cooking right i think everything has been done in cooking but there's still so many amazing restaurants open because you can take spaghetti and meatballs you can take pizza and you can take a steak but if you just put like your magic dust on it it changes the whole dish and that's all creativity is really or photography or any kind of design you just got to add your bit into it um, and I think it's, I think it, that makes it new, new. One thing I will say is like my, my pet peeve is when I see your work and I can, I know your Pinterest board. Like I could see your whole mood board. That's what I don't like. I, it's okay to copy, but now mix it so that I don't know where you got the information from. That's what I like. Yeah. If early sneaker culture was defined by Bob, Bobito Garcia's question, where'd you get those? What question or statement would you define sneaker culture today? Uh, for, be for better or for worse, I think it's how many of those were made? Or how much did you pay for those, which is even worse. I think that's where we're at right now. And I'm sort of guilty of it too, because I create shoes that are, you know, have resale value and are in high demand. But I think shoes that look really dope and have an incredible product design element, but are sitting like at Payless or Walmart, don't do anything, you know what I mean? Like now you have to add all this hype to it. Um, and that's, that's an easier said than done statement. But I think in the beginning days, hype meant like getting a designer or an artist to work on something or making something in limited numbers. But now the hype is like, 90% of the shoe at this point, you know, like it's not even about 
uh, product design or the art of it anymore. So I'd like to see sneaker culture get back to a point where like, it's more about the stories that are going into the shoe and like the creation process, which Nike used to be really adamant about doing. You remember back in the day, like they do like interviews with like sneaker designers all the time and like all the time. All the time. And now it's just like, who's the hot rapper that we need to attach to the shoe? I'll tell you like for, and, and Aaron can attest to this too probably, but like back when, in the days when Aaron was at Nike, there was probably a lot of conversation of like, why doesn't Nike just sign a musician or a rapper or do a collab? And the higher ups at Nike would say, because A, they're not athletes, and B, there's a lot of um, danger and like sort of like risk assessment involved in like signing these guys, you know? And so now there's like a new regime there that decided Adidas is kicking our ass by doing, as you know what they do well, uh, and Nike was like, we gotta get on our own bandwagon and like, you know, sort of do that thing too. What is, the, what is the sneaker community missing today that it had in the early days? Oh. Hmm. Discovery. Yes. Who said that? Treasure no, you're abs that's a great fucking answer. Discovery. You no longer have that. You're absolutely right. Back in the day, I had so many odd jobs, you know, starting from when I was 13 years old. And every job I had had the sole purpose of buying shoes, right? So I started sweeping hair at a hair salon. I worked at a one hour photo shop. I bust tables at a Chinese restaurant, worked at a video store, like all sorts of weird jobs. And every check, I would go to the East Brunswick Mall in New Jersey at the athlete's foot. And the athlete's foot would have massive, you know, floor to ceiling shoe selection. And I would sit back and I would look through every one and I would see which one I wanted to buy. And I, no one told me what to buy. No one, there was no release date, no magazines that told you this was a hot thing. You just chose what would look good on your style. It was a discovery, as you said, sir. And that is gone now. Now, when you come into a store, you probably know more than the store staff when something is coming out, how many pieces were made, and who's backing it, right? Like, you guys know better. And when you come in, I would say nine out of 10 times, you know the shoe that you're looking for, which is very different than back then, where I would come in not knowing what was coming out, and I just, have to sort of look around for it, you know? Um, and I think that is a, that simple distinction changes the whole industry. And I think it's because the brand started to say like, brands used to make stuff, whether it's like North Face, Timberland, or Nike, right? They used to just make stuff. And then you all would be like, yo, I'm gonna rock this North Face jacket with this Timberland boot and like, you know, this um, throwback basketball jersey and I'm gonna make this look myself. And then the brands were caught on and they were like, whoa, all these like people that aren't, you know, mountain climbers, they're not like lumberjacks and they're not basketball players are buying our stuff. What, what's going on here? Then they were like, well, let's capitalize on this. How do we like now make more money out of them? So they, they turned the tables and by doing that simple action of stopping to make stuff that they thought was right versus they started to make stuff that they thought you wanted, that's like a huge change in the, in the whole culture. So I, I would love for it to get back to the point where like people, brands start making things that are right for the brand, not necessarily right for the culture. It's up to the culture to decide how a brand should be remixed and reinterpreted. Let's do word association. I'm going to say a word. I'm going to say a word or a phrase and I want you to say what comes to mind first. Okay. Yeezys by Kanye West. <laughs> Adi's savior. New York City. The Mecca. Adidas. Thank you, Kanye West. <laughs> Favorite sneaker in your closet? The first one that comes to my head is Presto. Okay. Yeah, I love the Presto. Nike. The goat, still. Sneakerhead. I don't know why, but grow up comes to my head. I don't know why. Fashion. Fuck fashion. <laughs> fashion. I hate the word fashion. I just hate, like, it's just clothing on our bodies, you know, that's it. And it's like, I just hate when people take fashion, like, way too seriously. I'm with you. <laughs> Puma. Hip hop. Jeff Staple. Uh, a hard worker. <laughs> Seattle. Supersonics. I don't know why. Sean Kemp. <laughs> 
Um, and just to talk about your, your recent collab with Puma. Yeah. Which we have the shoes. Yes. We have two pieces of it, but it's it's actually a very, it's, it's pretty large. There's like 30 pieces, clothing, and men's, like, women's. There's like four drops. Right. <laughs> it's called Interval. Um, and I'll give you the background of how this, this will be like a good lesson in how a collaboration happens. So if you guys have been following what we've been doing with Puma, this is actually like our fifth or sixth collaboration with Puma. We did a, a suede that was made in Japan. Very, very exclusive, like a hundred pieces. It was like $250 each. And that we did one time and that was awesome. Then we came back and did another collection where we did three suedes and a blaze of glory. Uh, and that was a fun project because the three suedes were available. Each of the one of three was available in a different region of the world. So the only way you could get all three it was a struggle. Like you had to call somebody you knew or, you know, buy it on eBay or something like that. But I wanted the hunt to come back. So I forced it um, by having Puma sell the three different shoes in three different regions, which by the way is a major pain in the ass for a brand to do now because all brands want to be global. They don't like to sort of say like, this is only for one region, this is for another region. Uh, then we did the Blaze of Glory, which was dope. And then we, and then they came back and said like, we love working with you guys. Like we want to do another thing. And I was like, honestly getting a little bit bored, like of just constantly doing the same thing. Um, so I was like, let me think about what I want to do. And at that point in my life, I was really getting out of shape in my life. And I was like trying to get into shape, but also balance my business. So I was like seeing a trainer and going to a gym and still running staple and doing all these meetings. So like, trying to just fit all of these different aspects of my health and my personal well-being and my job into like my day was really hard. So I said to Puma, since you are a performance company, maybe we could work on this collection together that from a footwear and apparel standpoint gets me through my day from hanging out with my girl to, you know, going to a boardroom to then going to the gym and then going back out like, you know, to a meet and greet or an event. Like I could wear that throughout the entire thing. And and I want it to be for men and women. And I want it to be multiple seasons. Like you said, I want it to be for like a year or two maybe. Um, and I said, I want it to be a new name. So I want, I don't want it to be just like Staple X Puma and that's it. But I want to create a new brand for you guys. And I remember I said this to them in my first meeting, like I was sitting with a boardroom and I said, um, I said, I want to create a new brand. And my goal is that one day you can fire me and then you can let somebody else do this brand going forward. Like I want that to happen. And so I thought of this brand called Interval, spelled um, N-T-R-V-L, which represents like the intervals of your day and how you move through your day, but also the intervals in your life. Like whether you're just starting a brand and you're hustling or whether you know, you've just got married and have kids or whether you're retiring, you go through different intervals of your life. So I wanted this brand to represent that. And I really got to give it up to Puma for saying yes to all of those crazy things that I just asked for um, and allowing me the flexibility to do that. You know, Puma's really good in that respect where like um, they trust, you know, you see it in the, in the Rihanna collection they do. Like, I think there's a lot of other brands that would have rejected a lot of the things that Rihanna wanted to do, but for better or for worse, they just say like, yeah, let's try it like that way. So it's dope. They're, they're total, the Puma's awesome to work with. Yeah. Yeah, they're just like really nice people. Yeah, they are. Oh, <laughs> my